What's going on everybody? This is Alex, a doctoral candidate at NUS Business School in Singapore, and I welcome you to another episode of the Foresight Chats. In each episode of this series, I have a conversation with a leading figure in the field of futures and foresight, to whom I try to ask crucial, difficult, sometimes ignored, sometimes even not so politically correct questions about the field and about the futures in general encouraging critical discussions that perhaps have not been heard of. The guest I'm talking to today is someone with experience in some of the most fascinating methods in futures and foresight, and who is also running one of the top and longest running podcasts about the futures. Today, I have the privilege to talk to Peter Hayward. Peter describes himself very modestly as someone who has found Foresight in 2001, who studied it with Richard Slaughter, who pursued a PhD in it, who taught it for 14 years to passionate and skillful people, and who, after an academic career, eventually decided to engage with his real passions, and that is, talking with and bouncing ideas to his heroes through the podcast FuturePod. But when you will listen to this conversation, you will soon realize that Peter is the real hero in the room here. In the following conversation, we talk about Peter's insightful views on solving clients' problems with Foresight, while at the same time being modest about what Foresight can do for organizations. Then we talk about the futures games that Peter has developed, including the Sarkar game and the Pollock game and about his experience in using them with a diverse array of organizations all over the globe. And the way Peter has translated complex theories of social change into these simple, applicable and enjoyable games to uncover hidden assumptions of individuals in organizations is not only admirable, but also just nothing short of astounding. We also talk about the resistance that Pierre has faced, like me, when introducing Futures and Foresight in a business school, in his case in Australia, and about the reasons behind it. Finally, we talk about his podcast, FuturePod, and specifically about what had led him and his team to start it, and about what he has learned over the years from his guests. So, I hope you will enjoy the conversation. Peter. I am so honored to be talking to you again. Thanks for being here and welcome to the Foresight Chats. Thanks, Alec. It's great to chat, talk again. So we had an amazing conversation in the occasion of my guest interview at the FuturePod, but unfortunately I did most of the talking. So, <laughs> and uh, I've always wanted to ask you more, especially because you have such a rich experience in the field. So I wanted to go on with a sequel of that conversation and talk to you another time. And I think if you don't mind, we can connect this conversation with what we have said before, but also I would like to ask you more about your own experience in the field. So if that is okay for you, I would start with a question that I think is very much related to the issues we have talked before at FuturePod. And then I will ask you more questions about your your own experience in the field later on. Is that okay? Okay, that's good. Let's do it. All right. So last time we talked a lot about the importance of empirically testing the claims we have in futures and foresight. And well, that was majorly me. I talked a lot about uh, the importance of finding out the outcomes of what we do in futures and foresight with empirical research, and also uh, finding out which method is good in which context. And I remember I made the case that this was useful, not just for understanding better what we do, but also to make us more established in academia, because if we can prove our claims, then other scientists will understand that futures and foresight is more legitimate. But when I was listening to the conversation, I found that there was a missing point that I wanted to dwell a bit longer. And that is whether testing our claims empirically is actually also good for practice, for our clients and for futures and foresight practitioners in general. Because in my experience, especially recently that I've been digging deeper into the outcomes of futures and foresight, I also noticed that 
clients generally appreciate a lot when you have knowledge about the effectiveness of what we do in specific contexts. And they find that, um, that experience very valuable. In my consulting, I found that when I can advise clients about which method to use in which context, and when I can explain why foresight is useful with research, then I'm much more welcomed by the client. So I wanted to ask you whether in your case, you also found that to be true because you have such a rich experience in practicing several different methods. And so you must have run across this issue. Is it true that clients also like when we have empirically tested uh, propositions about what we do? Or is it just still unfortunately based on network or word of mouth or the necessity to hire a particular practitioner because he or she is famous? What is your point of view on this? It's my honest answer, Alex, is it's, it's a bit of both. Mm. Um, and this might be the way that I worked as a consultant. But in my, in my experience, most people don't, don't, or sorry, most clients don't ask for a foresight piece of work. Most clients that I worked with, let them be anything from people in local government or central government or business people or community groups, they were wrestling with a problem and it was about something they needed to do or had difficulty doing everything between designing a new product, building a better health policy, getting information out to a community, doing feedback. But it was quite a, for most people, they have a practical need and I help them do the thing they wanted to do and in doing so i may have used a foresight process or i'm or i may have used other processes about supporting change or making decisions or doing mm -hmm. kinds of things because for me futures and foresight is a problem solving firstly is a problem solving process for people in other words if you've got a problem like i don't know what to do or i've got to make a decision then there's a whole lot of using the future to help you act in the present is, in fact, I think what the bulk of the work that we do. We help people use the future in order to make present-based decisions. And for most clients, the efficacy is in whether you help them or not. Mm. <laughs> and the empirical basis of whether you help them is not of interest uh, and would probably get in the way, so to speak. Now, there are other people who may be through the politics, the level, the context, the subject matter, may want the empirical evidence that says you're putting forward that this piece of work is the best way to do it. You might be doing a tendy, you might be doing a proposal for a large piece of work. And in that situation, I think the empirical backup that, that actually says look, this works, here's evidence where it works, um, I think is it's fundamental because if we're talking to people who have to be convinced that what you're suggesting is an alternative way of, a, of a approaching a decision, then they need some confidence that you're not just making this up. So that's kind of my... Um, I'm saying yes and no, depending on whether you're just there helping a person make a decision, which is the bulk of what you do, or you're in a situation where I'm actually defending or arguing or advocating for a foresight piece of work is the best way to tackle something. So there is there is something there that um, I, I want to you to elaborate further. Do you think there is a latent need oftentimes that customers or clients or practitioners have about solving a problem through a foresight tool, which they don't know it, it should be done with a foresight tool. So it is our job to, and our uh, role to convince them that the foresight tool is the right 
way go and solve that problem? Is there a latent need that we need to respond? Um, I found a lot of times, and again, uh, my situation is a bit different because I was, for most of my consulting work, I was actually an academic who consulted. So I was a kind of part-time academic and part-time consultant, so to speak, a pracademic, if you want to call the two things. So if people found me or knew of me, they often found or knew of me via the academic foresight side of things. So what that meant was that, um, what I was going to say was that people often came to me saying, oh, Peter, um, we're thinking of doing scenarios. Could you help us? Now, what I found, Alex, over time was people often came to me saying, we'd like to do scenarios. And what I learned to do was I said, okay, fine, you think you need scenarios. I didn't say this, but what I would say to the person is, tell me what it looks like when I've been successful. What can you do after whatever I do that you can't do now? And if, in fact, the scenario is the thing you're asking for, then, we, then in fact, we might do a scenario. But I, people often use the language of scenario because scenario is, is a shorthand for many people to say, well, I don't know much about foresight, but I know this thing called scenarios. So, yeah, we probably need scenarios. So I, I learned that if someone asked for scenarios to not assume they knew they needed scenarios, I learned to to just spend some more time talking with them about what it, what is it you don't have now? What is it you cannot do easily now? Or what could you do if I'm successful? Mm. What will you be able to do that you can't do now? So that to me was how I kind of learned. And I didn't care what the person asked for. They may have been right. They, they in fact, may have wanted scenarios, but there might have been something else they wanted as well. Amazing. So there are a couple of things uh, I, I completely agree. Well, th the first is that I think there is a difference there between our role in advising clients directly on the the effectiveness of certain tools, inc including but not limited to scenarios, to solve a problem that is there. And they are aware of the problem, but not of the tool. And that is one thing. And there is another role that we are often called to participate in, which is there might be an organization that consults to clients and they ask us, can you actually tell us more about the different stuff that you do? Yeah. Uh, do, do, do you, you, you use foresight for what purpose in what specific context? And maybe there is a difference there. At least this is emerging in my experience, but again, I, this is just an hypothesis. Maybe there is a difference there in that when you do the first, right, you're just talking with the client directly. So you're not so much interested in explaining the empirical basis, the academic yep. foundations, right? You just want to solve the problem they are interested in and they want that too, right? But on the second, on the second, in the second realm, you're actually very much or interested in explaining that what you do is legitimate and you have a foundation and there are tools for a reason and some other tools for another reason. So I guess there is a difference between these two types of mm. practitioner work, right? And I have seen that. And I have to say that maybe my experience in, in having, in seeing that empirically proven methodologies are um, well received is maybe in the second yes. uh, rather than in the yeah. first. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, for for most government work that is of scale, you know, in terms of both uh, length of time or subject matter or the actual financial value of it, then you are more akin to tendering for the piece of work. So you will put forward a formal proposal about the method you would use, the scope of how they'd be used, the efficacy and basis for why you choose those methods, your confidence and and uh, history in in actually doing those things. So you, so you would actually build a, a formal tender response, and in that situation, it is it is it is key. I mean, for you to get the work. I mean, most governments now require there to be a competitive tender process for large government contracts. So the very thing you're asking for is what you will do 
if you are tendering for significant pieces of work in a government sense, and I would imagine too, you know, in a large corporate sense. Absolutely. There is another thing that comes to my mind when you say that, uh, which is when you actually do and solve a problem with foresight, we also need to be super modest about uh, what we do because oftentimes the problems we are trying to solve can be solved by other methods, right? Yeah. And um, I have seen the hegemony of certain tools in that they are they are described as something that can solve any possible organizational impact. (laughs) So what do you think about that? Because, you know, on one hand, I feel that via a facilitation intervention using a futures and foresight method or process, which is usually encouraging people to talk about the problems by itself, there is high chances that the problem will, will be untangled, at least understood in a better manner and eventually solved. But on the other, we can also, we cannot also uh, say that foresight is good at any single problem, right? There might be expertise and expertise in, I don't know, change management and other practices, strategy workshops, right? That are not, yeah, can, can equally solve the problem. So how do you, how do you manage that fine line of modesty when you talk uh, to an interlocutor? I mean, if I, I mean, I pivoted into academia. I didn't expect it. I mean, I was working in change for the Australian government in their main revenue organisation. So I was kind of a change manager. Um, I was leaning into futures work as part of bringing the futures idea scenarios and scanning into their change management processes, which is why I originally studied foresight. If I had not have, if I hadn't pivoted into academia and done a PhD and then become an academic slash pracademic, mm. then I would I would have I would have continued to practice as a change manager. <laughs> I would not have called myself a foresight practitioner. I would have called myself a change manager. And I and and I would have because I did, but I would have integrated the foresight tools that I was mm. learning alongside with the business improvement tools and the change management tools that I already knew. And so for me, if I was arguing for someone as to how they might, you know, turn their foresight passions into a career, then it would always be, well, what is the core work that you are going to support people in them doing? Uh, You know, if you're an internal foresight person, then you are still supporting what the organisation does and you're using foresight to help them do it, whatever that thing is, whether it's, you know, a service organisation, a government policy, uh, a pizza company, it doesn't matter. I mean, the context is we're in the business of X, whatever X is, and you employ foresight to help them. So the thing for me, to me, the modesty is, well, foresight, I mean, if you understand the domain the challenge, what what the organisation's trying to do, then foresight is just something that, well, it'll help in this part of it. So, yeah, a classic would be foresight tools rarely deliver the completed outcome. So you might use foresight to open up thinking, to create possible futures, to maybe even do backcasting to get... um, uh, uh, implementation pathways, and that's all good stuff. But now you've got to land it in the organisation and deliver it, and you're not going to, and you're probably not going to use foresight tools for that. You're probably going to use basic uh, project implementation planning, um, um, yeah, you know, uh, measurement tools to actually land it. So to me, foresight is never the complete process. Foresight is something that is integrated into other quite effective decision support tools. Uh, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. In fact, I I think that uh, hybridizing tools is uh, perhaps a a way to get foresight into the the purview of many more organizations. And to add to your point, you know, just recently I had had the opportunity to take part in a project 
uh, in a foresight project where we facilitated a scenario intervention for an organization that had clear a clear need for cohesiveness around its core identity. So we realized that this was something approachable with a foresight tool. And specifically when you transfer, when you translate scenarios into strategy, you can definitely tackle that specific aspect of building that core identity that supports the strategy of the organization in the futures. So we could do that. And in fact, me and uh, John Sweeney uh, designed um, a method to do that, which is gonna be uh, published soon in an article. But then I also realized that after our intervention, each specific member of the organization might not have had an alignment with that core identity. Mm. So that second need, which was which was kindly reminded me by another practitioner, uh, Christina, uh, in the project, that second need was more about aligning each person's specific goals in the future with the goal of the organization. And that to me seemed like something that could or could not, you know, may or may not have been tackled with a foresight approach. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, we left it open-ended and we might we might go back to the organization to to talk about that in the future with a non-foresight approach. So I think to add on your point, it's very important when to to set up to set up the limits, right? We can say, okay, we can do as much, but then we notice there is another problem. And well, maybe there is something we cannot do here, right? So that is, to me, is the modest, the modesty of it. Yeah, and there's a. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of networking and collaborative work. And there is a tremendous pressure when you are a, a consultant and your ability to pay the rent is based on bringing the dollars in the door. There is a natural reluctance to share work. Mm. But I actually think that if we, that for you and John, for example, if you actually find someone that you like working with who does something quite distinct but actually really dovetails well with you, then I think it's better for clients to actually bring in practitioners working with different tool sets but they, are, but they work well together. And I think the ability to actually say, here is the foresight part. Here is the foresight part and how it integrates. But then there's a point where you actually kind of pass it over to the next person. Yes. Well, it sounds like, but doesn't that make the possibility that the other person will somehow show you up or get the return work and everything else? And my answer is, well, that's part of the risk. But think of the benefits you get. Yes. That if you get to see... That yeah, you know, if the other person gets to sit in while you're working and and see what you're doing, and then you get to sit in and see what they're doing when they're working, oh, yeah. then the ability to actually learn off one another is, I mean, to me, yes, I can see short term risk, but I can see long term benefits. And so, for me, yeah, you know, again, it was easier for me because I was a, yeah, you know, I, I was to some extent an academic as well as a consultant. Right. But I always wanted to find opportunities to collaborate and because whether you collaborate with an art theorist, I mean, I've worked with you know, interesting people who've got different ideas and I just think it's better for you as the practitioner, but it's also doubly better for the client to actually have different ideas, not so different that it's, that it's you know, uncohesive, but yeah, I think the idea of collaborating with people so that a client is stewarded or passed, or, yeah, or kind of supported in the process. Um, that's what I'd kind of suggest might be the way, rather than try and spread yourself too thin. Yes. Oh, absolutely, Peter. Uh, th thanks for that. I have to apologize because I don't know if you heard, but it started raining, and when it rains in Singapore, <laughs> it, it rains very heavily. So I think this will be heard, even if the microphone is a podcast microphone. I think it will be heard. So apology for that. Anyway, so we talk a lot about practitioners and uh, how to make our methods good for them. Um, I, I, I would like to move on to specific methodologies because you have an amazing experience with 
several methods, but you are very well known for being one of the proponents and developers of several futures games, which is perhaps one of the most fascinating area of futures and foresight. So I wanted to talk a bit with you about futures games, and we could start by perhaps the one that comes to my mind first, which is oftentimes uh, the arguably more fascinating game, the Sarkar game. The Sarkar game has been called a way to teach macrohistorical theory of change, of social change, to individuals. And yep. when when I hear that, to me <laughs> is so fascinating that such a macro, you know, bird eye view can be in any way useful to very tangible needs of organizations and practitioners mm -hmm. and individuals. So um, I want to ask you more about the implications of this game, but, but why don't we start with a very brief introduction? Why don't you just very briefly introduce the Sarkar game uh, for an audience that may or may not be aware of it, so then we can talk more, more about uh, what it does. Sure, yeah, no, it's... Uh... It's been it's been amazing just to see where Sarkar game has gone. Um, look, the game itself, it started in 2001. I think it was 2001 where actually um, I was studying the Master of Foresight with Richard Slaughter and we had the opportunity to, to work for um, a couple of days with Sahail in Atula. And Sahail, as I now know, is a superstar in our space, but... One of the things Sahail spent time talking to us on the first day was he introduced macro history. He wrote a book with uh, Johan Galtung called Macro History and Macro Historians, magnificent book. Mm. And one of the theories of macro history that he explained was uh, P.R. Sarkar's social cycle, which is a model of social change through four classic archetypes of Indian culture, uh, worker, warrior, intellectual, merchant, and how these um, epistemes or vanyas, um, how history we move through them. And it, it was fascinating, and I'm a student of history, so of course I could see the historical parallels. But what happened, Alex, was that that night because I was also an organisational animal, this is you know, this is when I was working in change in the Australian Taxation Office. And change, as you know, in organisations is a contested, dramatic process. What I saw in this broad sweeping theory of social change was I saw the drama of organisation. Mm. I very quickly, I remember sitting down at breakfast and I jotted down the kind of what, what really became the dynamic of the game, that... When you bring change into an organisation, it's not a straightforward process. There is a real clash of ideas and there is conflict and there is um, there are winners and losers and change happens or it doesn't or change is resisted and undermined and all this. Kind of, and so I saw in the Sarkar, ineffectively Sarkar's theory, I saw a little potted version of how you could model and act out how change happens in an organisation. I showed Sahail this, um, which was pretty, <laughs> which was pretty interesting. And Sahail said, "That's cool. Um, you should write it up." I don't know if I did write it up at that time, but we talked about it. And then when I was teaching with Joe Voros in the Masters, when when we took over teaching the Masters course, so to speak, a, a year or so later. We wanted to teach some theories of social change, and so we decided to in to kind of turn the Saka theory of change into a game, and that's and that's where wow. the game. And we actually played it in the classroom, and we such think an we, insight. Yeah, and and then of course having then come up with a model of a game, and if you want to know how the game's played, if you go if you uh, put Saka game in. Um, in your search engine, if you can find the link to Peter Bishop's Teach the Future, Peter has a three-page beautiful explanation of how you set it up, what the scripts are, or that kind of thing. You'll also find it sitting on the Prout website of the Ananda Marga, and you'll find, I think, um, uh, 
Uh, Corey Doctorow's got an article on it. <laughs> there is, no, it's around and, and people have played it. But the thing about it, Alex, is because it, 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 because it's actually dramatically, it, it's framed in the drama of life mm. where I want something and there's, a, and there's another group who are either going to support me in it or they're going to oppose me in it. And because it's a, because it's a drama, then, of course, it lends itself to play because all play is dramatic by its nature. The thing, I, the thing about it, which I didn't realise but now I do, is that the archetypes are not Indian archetypes. I think they are cultural archetypes because I have played the game in different countries um, and the game plays differently in the culture that it's, that it's located. So if you play the game in Taiwan, they play it a particular way. If you play it in America, they play it a particular way. If you play it in Eastern Europe, they play it in a particular way. The archetypes, you know, worker, warrior, intellectual and merchant, those are universal. But the cultural energy as to who feel, you know, what does the culture feel confident in, what does the culture feel inferior in, that's the insight. Now, what it's got to do with futures is the cycle, if, if you haven't got ideology taking the, the drama forward, then the drama tends to go nowhere or goes down. But there's actually a fifth role in the Sarkar game, which is the person who sees the drama and moves it. And that, of course, was what Sarkar wanted. Sarkar wanted revolutionaries who took drama and, you know, took the energy of drama and used it to move the system somewhere. And that's why the Sarkar game is so powerful, I think, for people, because once they understand the drama they're in, whether it's how do we get people to use uh, uh, green power versus how do we, you know, as I say, it, everything that is a drama, the real question is how do we, how do we utilise the drama and the energy in the drama to actually take the system somewhere that we think is better. And that that's kind of what the game's about. I think you have already in some way also replied to my uh, possible sub subsequent question, which, which, which was about the implications of the game. And I think where you're going is that there is a universal architecture of belief of knowledge which the game taps into very directly right and that architecture of belief is archetypes which are present no matter where you go because they reflect the way that people have behaved over millennia right and yeah. i think this also connects with a lot of scholarship outside of the field i mean not just micro history but all the work that Jordan Peterson has done on uh, maps yep. of meaning, the, the structure of belief, and also Gebser with the mythological understanding of the, the reality we have. So there is a lot of social science on that. So there is certainly there is certainly a power in using those archetypes, which are there in the past, they are in the present, and they're likely going to be in the future, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing about Sarkar and why it's such a great game to play with people that are wrestling with a drama is that you can play the game. People, people can play the game with minimal guidance. In other words, literally you write the script down on a tiny piece of paper, whether you have props or you don't have props, it doesn't matter. People, people will generally enter into the game and play the game out. Now the game plays very quickly and the drama happens quickly. Uh, and, and just yeah, to, just, just to clarify with the audience, uh, the four categories, right? Merchant, yep. oh, just repeat them for me, please. Yeah, basically, you start with the group, of, you need about 10 people. Right. And you, you assign can play them it up. To, yeah. Yeah. You, you can play it up to 100. <laughs> okay. You can play it in a room. You can play it outside in a park. It doesn't matter. But pretty much what you do is you stand with your group and you break them. You generally say, go to the four corners of the room. So whatever the space is. And people basically put themselves in four equal groups. And then you look at the four groups and you generally have got some idea of who you think has got a bit of go in them. And you would nominate them as, well, you're the, okay, you're workers. And so you'd give them the worker script. 
then you, then the way I do the game is I move immediately, then moving clockwise. The next group in the room are given the warrior script. The next group in the room moving clockwise are given the intellectual script. And the last group in the room are given the merchant's script. And the game starts when the workers, whatever they they start doing something, mm. <laughs> whatever they choose to do, play out this, play out their role. And the warriors are the first group in when they see what the workers are doing. And that plays until it reaches a point where you want to stop the game because you think the dynamic has pretty much happened, what's going to happen. And then you stop the game and then you ask the intellectuals who've been watching the game for maybe maybe two, two minutes to five minutes to enter the game. So now you've got the three groups right. in the room. And then when you choose, you stop the game again and then you invite the merchants in and then you let the game play for as long as you want to make it play and then you stop it and then you debrief what the heck just happened. And and people then, both what they did, I mean, one of the things Sahail does, which I think is fantastic, is Sahail runs, runs it with large groups. So he breaks the room into two parts. He has a smaller group play the game and a larger group watch the game. And so a lot of people are on the audience watching the game and then they, they're they part of the debrief. In other words, so and it's what people see in the drama that becomes, because that's the point. You play the game in order to have the insight. So you know when I'm a, so you know when I'm a warrior, I wanted to boss people around. I mean, you know, uh -huh. or when I'm an intellectual, I didn't feel I had power. Or when I'm a, yeah, you know, or I was a merchant and I, you know, Amazing. and I just separated. Yeah, you know, I split people up in order to win. The thing about once you play the game, and the game plays very quickly, you can actually play a drama in probably 15, 20 minutes. You might you might debrief it for another half an hour. But here's the really powerful part. You can now ask people to go back into the – you can say, now, I want you now to choose where you are in this drama of your organisation. In other words, don't in other words, stand if you think you're a warrior. Stand if you think you're intellectual. Stand if you think you're a worker. Now play the game you want to play play the game you want it to be played and now you move from simply drama as an experiential you go to drama as a normative process and people act out effectively their preferred future so it's a way to notice our well the players assumptions and blind spots yeah and i i think I think when I was preparing for this interview, I read I read some of your work, and you mentioned that the game is so fascinating because it allows people to uncover their own blind spots, and even very different people can have the same kind of powerful. I mean, different reactions, but oh. equally powerful. And I remember you you you've written that either executives or also monks can have. Yep. Um, yep as diverse as th those two categories can have an equally powerful experience right but yes whatever whatever you said is still is still to me something that connects well to understanding understanding how the world is in general works and your role in the world when you have a lens to it but then how is the game translated into a strategic option or a strategic insight or is it done anyway because i i completely understand that it can uncover yeah. right uncover the blind spot but then what how do you act on those discoveries well, well again the thing people have still got to want i mean i mean what sits in the background what sarkar brings into the room is mm -hmm. power and how power plays mm -hmm. out in us because <laughs> not everyone's got power I mean, the game, people have distinct power. You have the power of chaos, you have the power of physical domination, you have the power of ideas, and you have the powers of exchange. They're quite distinct powers. Because the game if... plays, the game yeah. plays and power plays out. So, for example, if one of the warriors gets out his gun and shoots people, that's power. <laughs> if... 
you know, if the workers, you know, kind of uh, grab the chairs and stack the chairs up so the warriors can't, that's power. In other words, people act out whether they feel powerful or not. Mm. Now, in my opinion, most most organisations don't talk openly about power. <laughs> I see. Okay. I talk about strategy, marketing, planning, but those are all ways to instrumentalise power. <laughs> power doesn't go away because we not talk about it. In fact, if we don't talk about it, then power happens in ways that is both constructive and destructive. So to me, what Sarkar does by playing a game, a silly game, people suddenly have a conversation about power and how they manage power, within, whether they felt comfortable within the organisation. Within the organisation, right, that's right. Okay. Now, once you understand power when it's beneficial and useful and power when it's destructive and then, well, then when you ask the question about the normative future we want to create, yeah. how you deploy power becomes central to being successful or failing to get to your normative future. I wonder if Sarkar has been somehow affected by postmodernism or whether there was a yes. connection there because yes. this sounds very much like uh, the basic tenets of postmodernism, right? Uncover the power structures that enable and constrain organizations. Now, of course, I have my misgivings about postmodernism because there are other factors more than power, for sure. There is chance, biology, um, history and so on, but power is an undeniable force among yeah. others. So I guess there is an influence there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can be very playful and very provocative in the game. I'm, mm. I mean, one of the things I do in the game when I when I was playing it is I give I give plastic guns to the warriors. Mm. Wow! And one of the rules I have is the warriors have to have their guns on display. So you can't put the gun in your back pocket. Yeah, yeah. Because I saw people playing the game as warriors, but they wouldn't carry their guns. And I asked them, why weren't you carrying your guns? And they said, Well, the guns make people uncomfortable. And I said, But you have, but you're the only ones with them. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. so I said, No, no, I want you to have, I want you to have your power on show. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to use it. But as I said, I want people to understand what what are their instruments of power and how do they feel about them. Now, the gun, the gun is a metaphor to yes. acknowledge the power. Yes. Yeah. And I wanted people to acknowledge that only you've got them. No one else has got them. Now, and one of the postmodern things I saw was people saying, "Oh, guns are bad." And of course, the answer is, "Oh, no." <laughs> I mean, guns are an instrument of power. I mean. I mean, power is necessary. If you want to change they are the there, system, yeah. you need power. You need power. Um, you can't. You can't not use physical power and be and hope to be successful. The same reason you can't use intellectual power. So, for example, when I played the game um, amongst the monks in Taiwan, wow. the intellectuals ran the game. <laughs> when I played the game in Australia, often the people in business in environments felt as intellectuals, I didn't know what my power was. That's a phenomenal and, experience there. Yeah, as I say, it is, it's a mirror. It's a mirror to how people see themselves in their role and whether they feel powerful or not. And it's a, and, and it's a mirror for how people react to the other forms of power around them because that's when the drama starts. So what does the warrior do? So if you've got physical power in an organisation, what do you do when, when you encounter intellectuals with different ideas? Yeah. You know, and, you know, the insight of I've seen it where the warriors come in thinking the workers are a problem and as soon as the intellectuals come in with their ideas, the guns suddenly start getting pointed at the intellectuals. Wow. <laughs> and, and I've had people say, that was so much like my organization where I came up with an idea and suddenly I felt like I was seen as an enemy. And so it uncovers again, it, the, uh, sorry, it uncovers yeah. the roles 
they are subconsciously holding on to yep. within their organizations. Yeah. And gives you the option of saying, if you want to create something different, then or maybe not, you yeah. play the role differently. Absolutely. You know, as an organizational scholar as well, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm doing futures and foresight, but I'm also in a organization management and organization department. I see so much potential for studying this phenomenon, this intervention, you know, as yep. a phenomenon of study, which might be completely outside of the purview of mainstream organizational scholars. But I think just the way the way this game is played and the powerful stuff it uncovers would be so interesting to yeah. study in a rigorous manner, right? You can just look at the yeah, change. And, and it's a game, as I said, I've played the game with young children, um, you know, business people. I've mm. played it in parks. I've played it in hallways. Everyone knows how to play the game. <laughs> yeah, They all play it differently. And it, but when you're in an organization and you have and you i mean everybody has has a share of power to some extent and different power effective organizations the power is in concert towards a shared goal and when the organization is in dysfunction then the power of course is basically held by one group yeah. others feel disempowered people actually aren't yeah, you know, people aren't moving towards the shit. They wouldn't even know what it was. What does, again, Sarkar talked about healthy and unhealthy forms of the roles. So it's not about good or bad. It's about health or unhealthy. So there's the warrior that protects you and there's the warrior that oppresses yeah. you. There's the intellectual that's about creating ideas and there's the intellectual that says, no, only my ideas. There's the merchant who's into exchange and contracting and partnering and the merchant who wants to turn everything into an economic benefit. And then there's the worker, of course, who can give service or can bring chaos. In other words, all the forms have a healthy and unhealthy form. And, of course, as futurists, we'd say, well, let's choose the healthy forms. <laughs> let's design for healthy warrior, healthy intellectual, healthy merchant and ultimately healthy worker and let's take it towards a future that we think is a better future and as i say you can play saga game just simply to understand how you work better and you can also understand saga to understand how you might change the system it makes total sense that there is a difference there uh, that when there is a possibility that each single group act healthy or, or unhealthy it, it just how how scenarios also are framed, you know. Uh, oftentimes they're framed in relatively more positive or relatively more negative manner without without falling into the dystopia or utopia hmm. or falling into the dystopia or utopia. So I can see the tangible the, the tangible use of this game. I think I'm going to have to to create an instructional video of, of this game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'd be good. That No, that, that'd be I good, think right? I'm, I think on the foresight chats it would be uh, it would be great fun. I think you should uh, I, I think you should play it with your colleagues at the uni and then we'll sit down and um, and I'm happy to you know, you know to, to, to sort of help you kind of you know pull it out. But there is quite a lot written. I mean, Sahail very generously has written some wonderful pieces um, in the journals on the use of Sarkar, and I know he uses Sarkar quite a lot in his organisational interventions. Um, yeah, there, as I say, it's. It's pretty widespread now. It's and it's just a simple tool to use. My again, I'm going to encourage people just pick it up, change it, do what you like yeah. with it. Um, it's. I've it's, seen a lot of applications, indeed, but uh, I'm not sure if we can find some uh, videos about how it is applied and how actually it works. So I'm I'm going to look into that. Yeah. But yeah, it sounds like something that I would like to to know more about. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. How about the Polar game? Because you have also been uh, a, the developer, either the developer or, or the proponent or a strong proponent of the Polar game. Yeah. And um, that is an equally fascinating yeah. uh, game that has equally powerful results. So can yeah, that's can, yeah, that's oh, another one again. I was when I when I was actually doing my PhD, I was reading mm -hmm. um, Polak's um, Image of the Future. Uh, and again, as is my nature, 
I saw suddenly when Pollack, when, when Frederick Pollack, uh, and again, I'm going on the bolding translation, so I'm not working in the Dutch. Mm. But when I read the way that Balding had translated this notion that what, again, when Pollack did the image of the future, you're talking about post-World War II Europe. Mm -hmm. And like Spengler and all the others, at that time there was there were a lot of intellectuals who looked at you know, where Europe you know was heading post post the war. Um, and Polak identified this notion of the image of the future that if a culture had an image of the future that encouraged people and had energy, then that culture went forward. And if the image had lost its luster and attraction, the culture went backwards. And, and, and he talked about this notion of images that falling within these two axes, this notion of essence optimism and essence pessimism, and this notion of influence or non-influence. And if so... Once someone gives you two dimensions, you've got a two by two matrix. <laughs> that's the that's the consultant in me. Once I've you know, so once I've got two axes, I can cross them, <laughs> and once I can cross them, I've got a game. And so that's where what Pollack and and the Pollack game. And again, it's it it's written up. Um, I did a paper just recently with uh, Stuart Candy. Um, it's it ten it can work as a pair to Saka, so you can often run it mm. for both. And what you do with this with the Pollack game, it's quite simply is you take your your people and you say, let's and I and I call this where do you stand? And it's it's about saying where do you stand and how do you see the future? So this is a this is a quick game to ask people both how do you see the future, but where are you standing when you describe the future? And and so you ask people to basically arrange themselves in a line from I see the world getting better versus I see the world getting worse. <laughs> and that's your north-south line, so to speak, and everyone lines up on a line somewhere. And then you say, now hold that position, and then you go to the east-west and you get them to step either towards the side that says I believe people have influence or I get them to step to the side of saying I don't believe people have influence. And at that point, in, in that orientation in two directions, people have put themselves in four quadrants. And those four quadrants are there's a bunch of people who are optimistic about the future and believe they have agency. There's another group who are optimistic about the future sorry, who are pessimistic about the future, relatively speaking, but also still feel have influence. There's a group saying, I'm optimistic about the future, but I don't particularly feel I have, have influence. And there's a last quadrant, which is I'm both pessimistic about the future and don't believe I have influence. And once you get those four positions, then you've got a wonderful conversation to have about right. wh why are you standing there and why are you standing there? And... and and so what Polak game is, Polak game is at the level of the personal. So if if Sarkar's the drama mm. and also history, you know, the big slow game, then Polak is that is is the kind of individual to miso level of how do I feel about my history through the world and how do I see my future? And so what, what typically happens when you play it with an organisation? And I've done this where you if, you, if you're working with the executive, for example, well, generally speaking, when you're working with the executive of an organisation, they'll all be up in the right-hand the right -hand, uh, corner, which is the, you know, because, because they're on the executive, one would imagine they are both optimistic about the future and feel they have influence. <laughs> If you talk to the people who work in the organisation, they could be standing somewhere else. And what becomes interesting when you when you have people in an organisation and some people standing in different quadrants, you can say, how do you talk to one another? How do you see one another? 
how do you make in other words, if you're standing in the lower left, of which is the quadrant of I don't believe the world's getting better and I don't believe I have influence, then do you really listen to people in the upper right saying you the world's mm -hmm. fantastic and you have influence when you yourself mm -hmm. don't see the world that way? So Pollack is a, is a game of communication across the different epistemologies of how people see the future. So if, and, Paula, if, if the Paula game is directed at a self-exploration about our own position in the future. And how, right. and how my view might be different to yours. Okay. Um, and again, with, and it's got infinite change around it because you can change the, you know, once you understand the kind of optimism, pessimism, influence, non-influence, then you can start to play with the axes and make the axes mean something else. But again, it's about, and the thing again is this notion of culture. Now again, Pollack saying, well, only the upper right has healthy, has healthy culture. I think people would argue, um, people often, you know, people can, people can create powerful culture in a number of quadrants. There's actually a powerful culture of the world's buggered and there isn't anything I can do about it. There's actually a culture of I can't make it worse. There's actually a culture of, of you know, let's just have a good time. In other words, we still understand it as a culture. It's still, a, it's still got an expression of the future. It might be different to yours, but it doesn't necessarily be wrong. It's about, because as I say, ultimately each of us are motivated by a particular idea about the future, or it is about the future. But what do we what do we do when we encounter people who don't agree with us? Do we do we disregard them, or do we try to talk to them? And if we do try to talk to them, where do we stand when we talk to them? Do we stand where we are, or do we go and stand where they are? Mm -hmm. And because uh, that's the thing, I actually think you actually you actually. The conversation about the future you want to create, I think you've got to often go and stand where someone else is standing and see the world as they see their world, not as you see your world. But go and talk to them where they are and in their world and then get and then talk to them about how they move, if they want to move, from where they are, not where you are. Is there a purpose there in this game, embedded in the game in some way, to potentially help those who do not feel have having agency on the future to actually start to have more agency because yes. I, yes. I mean I can I can think of the usefulness of having a negative view of the future and agency because one says all right there is a negative future coming I want to prepare for it so I'm going to do something for it and I That's can right. do it I have agency yep. Yep, exactly. And the, sa the same thing could be argued for positive images of the future. There is a positive future out there. I want to reap the benefit. I have agency. I can do it. Let's work, right? But then the question becomes, how about those who have a negative view of the future and no agency, right? There's a negative future coming. I cannot do anything about it. I'm just going <laughs> to expect the apocalypse. So is there a way for this game to encourage those peoples in that quadrant to change their mind, is that possible? Is this something you think? Seen? Look, you can certainly, and people do talk about how they might move. Mm. And I think you know, the, the notion of transformation, or the or or the notion of people transforming themselves, is important. Before then, Alex, I actually think it's really important that people be recognised and seen for where they the are, yeah, yeah, and listened to for where they are. Okay. Um, I mean, the assumption that being in the lower left in terms of, you know, the person who who believes there isn't much they can do and, and, and uh, believes the world's getting worse by itself is not necessarily a bad place to be long term. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it might be, that's just real. That's just how the world is. Um, if If you're not in that quadrant, if you're not of that view, then you can be made uncomfortable <laughs> by yeah. them being comfortable. <laughs> In other words, if you have had privilege 
that gives you optimism and someone else hasn't got optimism. You can ask them to move and find optimism or you can examine, but how come I've had agency? How come I get listened yeah. to? In other words, it can be about them to transform and move if they wish, but I'm going to also argue, how do you how do you justify and how do you use the opportunities that you have? Maybe you should move to them. Yeah. I have a proposition there, which is amenable to further research. I, I suggest that when you do the game, people will place themselves uh, at relatively more extreme positions. Yep. But by doing the game, through the process, they will eventually converge a bit closer to the center. Yeah, I mean, it's... Is that okay? Sometimes. I mean, it, okay. as I said, predominantly, I, I've played the game as a conversation starter. For example, a story I'll tell you is I played a pilot game mm. with a with an organisation that was part of a... that They were doing a day's planning. And just at the start of the day, it literally is the, as the icebreaker, I played the pilot game. And I got people to stand in a quadrant, I took, you know... You know, or basically I just did, you know, the north, south, east, west. And a lot of people stood up in the upper right and I mm. and, and I got them to describe the quadrant. There weren't there weren't many in the others and it, it was fine. I mean, they were basically saying, you know, we're optimistic and we've got agency and everything else. When it came time to do the planning and and people were trying to work out what they needed to do, people started to say to me, Oh, we can't do that. Oh, we, oh, no, that's not possible. No, we can't do it. And I just said to them, why were you standing in the upper right? And the answer was they were standing in the upper right. So, And then they just said, you're right, we were. So they just stopped. They stopped looking for the reasons why they couldn't do it, and they got mm -hmm. on with it. <laughs> All right. As I said, it... It was only a simple little process. Right, right. I didn't do it for that reason. But because they'd stood in that quadrant, no, I didn't make them stand there. <laughs> and then when they then started they acting, hey? Did they change to well, another quadrant? As soon as I start seeing learned helplessness, as soon as I start seeing people saying, we haven't got power, we haven't got power, mm. then I'm going, well, why were you standing there? Um. And in that particular case, as I say, the group kind of, yeah, because because that happens with groups. Yeah, you know, once someone says it, you know, it's not possible, they won't let us, we can't do it. Then that that tends to be a dynamic that starts. Right. And once people start telling you they can't do something, nothing, very hard for you to say to them, I think you can. But if they've actually acted out that they believe they can do it, then you just remind them. Um, as I said, it's. It can be integrated in with things. It can be played as part of, because certainly Sahail plays the two together and uses them as a pair because mm. both how you see the future and the role you're in go to, if you like it, go to the drama. Uh, so the Sarkar mm. and, and Polak can work as a pair in an interesting way. Both of them don't take long to play and both, and both give the group a lot of information. Um, or you can just play Polak as a communication device about how people talk about the future, where you are, where your staff are, where your customers are, <laughs> that right. kind of thing. Um, and then talk to them about ultimately what is the image of the future that you're arguing for? Because, <laughs> again, as Polak said, and I don't disagree with him, the image creates the culture. But it seems to me that when you facilitate the polar game, you have this value-free stance, at least in the beginning, right? Because Absolutely. Because you just Absolutely. ask, okay, why are you standing there? I mean, you, you're, you're not saying to the person, go move to the other quadrant. No. You just encourage that discussion, right? Okay. Yeah. And as, as I said, and, and particularly I play, again, if I if I listen to the people on the upper right, the people who are optimistic and the people who believe they have agency, and I get them to, and I get them to describe their world and and to and uh, to, and uh, and uh, you know to describe how they see themselves and the things they can do, 
And then I leave them and walk down to the people in the lower left. Hmm. And the first thing I say to them is, how do they sound to you? <laughs> right. And the people like that, I, I sound delusional. <laughs> <laughs> so pit them against each other, right? Well, because, of course, they do. Yeah, yeah. And then I go up to the upper right and say, how do you see them? And they say, yeah. oh, we see them as losers. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> well, this is also uncovering some more profound uh, political yes. stances as well. For yes, sure. yes, yes, yes. Okay. And because, and that's that's the whole point of gaming. Because to me, we do the intellectualizing about the future. You know, the future could be the future is possible. It might be this. It could be a uh, technology culture. Yada yada yada. And and that's all useful. But the thing I'm most interested, in, Alex, is how am I now? <laughs> And how are we now? Because how I am now and how we are now is fundamental to whatever future we we want to move towards or remove. So I'm not against or for the future. The future is important, but the notion that thinking about the future, even designing a normative future, somehow means that you've still got to be who you are and we have to be what we are as the as the vehicle to take us to the future or not so for me that's kind of why i like gaming because to me the game lets adults quickly get insight into how they are how they might be some of the misguided ideas they have some of the non and to understand how messy and creative that whole process is and to me that's why I started playing the games, both as a way to teach people, but also to give them insight so they can then choose what they want to do. And very simple games, very simple games. I think games don't need to be overly complicated. Um, and just to clarify, you've been very modest there because the idea to pit those two, um, those two uncertainties, those two axes, it was your idea, right? It was not there in the book uh, that Pollock has written. You saw that there and you made it out in the form of a game. So I just yeah. uh, want to credit that powerful <laughs> insight. Yeah. Yeah. And and Stuart Candy, who's doing some phenomenal work in gamification and simulation mm. and, uh, and uh, Jake Dungan, I mean, they've now taken, because I taught them, Saka, in uh, Hawaii years and years, sorry, uh, uh, Pollock years and years ago. Yeah. Well, they've taken it, and they've taken it in a slightly different direction. But that's, again, fine, because once you understand what you're trying to do with people, and, again, that's it's that's instrument. the beauty of these games, is it you don't have to play the game right. You play the game in a way that's useful for you and your audience. And yeah. because the games are so simple and require no technology, you can literally play them you know, in a hallway. Um, Thanks, Peter. Uh it seems like you're going to see a video about this later on in my channel. <laughs> I might get in touch with you to know more about the games before I do it. <laughs> yeah. So I want to move on to another question that I have particularly at heart, and that is the bridging between futures and foresight and business schools. Because for many years, you have been affiliated with Swinburne University and the business school in particular at that university, and you have been introducing Futures and Foresight in that school. So I wonder what is your experience in introducing Futures and Foresight in an environment that usually doesn't encourage it? Because yeah. I, I, right, I have also experienced a lot of resistance, so I wanted to know whether you had the same experience as well. Yeah, I mean, I have, I mean, certainly... When Richard started with the master's course at Swinburne and then Joe Voris took it over and then I was there with Joe and I was there for about 15, 15 years. Um, we had periods of resistance and periods of support. The way I make sense of that, Alex, is that business schools, I would say now, and again, I'm only talking about Australia, but I also pay attention. I mean, business schools generally around the world are in trouble <laughs> uh, in the sense that it's it's becoming harder and harder to get the numbers of students in to pay the certain amount of fees to pay their costs. Mm. I mean, business schools 
had a wonderful period of time in the 80s and 90s where they were the cash cows of most universities. It didn't matter what you did, whether it was an MBA or a Master of Accounting or whatever else, there were literally, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't teach enough people. Literally, people wanted business, whether it be marketing, human resource development, or whatever. And, and so these courses were cash cows for universities. The deans were lovely people. They would have got support and everything else. And then we saw more business schools and more business schools and more business schools. And then it's become competitive. And I would argue now it's now all kind of a, we've almost gone over the kind of oversupply of business schools now. And so now they're in that brutal process now of rationalising, yeah. well, what is a good business school and what's a not good business school? And if you take that and if you step out of, if that's the potted history of 50 years of business schools, and you look at universities general, you're going to say, hang on, but it isn't just been business schools that have been through that. I mean, that's happened to liberal arts, humanities. I mean, you, the universities themselves are going through fundamental change now. They're probably the big industry that are really on the cutting edge of a lot of uh, yeah, work, and, work and job design change, technology change that other industries dealt with 10, 20, 30 years ago. So to me, we sh you shouldn't be surprised that I'll, really any university and any course in a university is going to be really resistant to any change because, I mean, they are in trouble. You know, universities are going to be smaller and their offerings are going to be more targeted than what, than what they were. So as I said, I, to me, there is, I mean, People, people whose job are tied into I teach a discipline <laughs> um, are going to spend most of their time trying to protect their boundary and repel borders. And there aren't many academic disciplines, I mean, physical science, probably engineering. But w what we're seeing in terms of what's happening in the world is those hard barriers between fields are disappearing. Um, so you might say, well, I'm an engineer. What do I care about genetics? And the answer is, well, what about genetic engineering? And it's like, Always a bridge, yeah. Yeah, and, and to, me, the, to me, the disciplines are leaking into one another, which from the point of view of users and applications and even theorists, you're going to be going, great. I mean, you argue for that. You argue that we need disciplines that move across and support one another and hybridise and everything else, which is the opposite for what a lot of, what a lot of disciplines have done, which is they've specialised and become vertical and hierarchical when the world's saying, no, move the other way, become flatter and become, you know, less boundary driven. So, I mean, to me, the thing I'd say about business schools and foresight is we're never going to be a cash cow for them. So at one level, they're not going to be that interested in it because we're not going to you know, we're not going to teach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students doing foresight or masters or whatever else. I found students were comfortable with it because it was it, it was knowledge that was useful, whether they're doing marketing or HR or strategy or anything else. So basically students were saying, well, give me foresight, it's useful. So they had no problem of having a bit of foresight mixed in with their other stuff. The people who you taught in other discipline spaces, like I say, marketing people generally were happy to have a foresight person come in and do a bit of foresight with them. Strategy people were generally comfortable with it. In other words, I had less resistance at, I had almost no resistance in the classroom. I had less resistance when I deal with the academics in the room or the lecturers in the room. Mm -hmm. And most of the resistance came about because people are concerned about their jobs and their careers and their reputations. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, I don't, as I say, to me, I look at universities themselves are going to be unrecognizable in a decade's time. Um, I agree same, with you. Go on, please. No, as I say, the same thing I say to clients support people in what they're trying to do. If you've got a dean that's trying to be creative and expand the offering, then you offer integration of foresight with other disciplines because why wouldn't they want it? Why wouldn't you want? Uh, marketing people with foresight capability or strategy people with sure. foresight capability. And similarly, if someone simply wants the purity of the AACSB 
we, you know what it says an MBA is, that when you hear someone arguing for you know, purity and clarity and borders and everything else, then just back away. <laughs> because yes, you you saying, no, I think you're not right, I think you need this, is not going to help you or them, so back off and try someone who's interested. I hear you, uh, Peter. I, I think I agree with you in that no matter where you where you go in a university and try to promote futures and forest that you will find resistance just because the very the very crux of our field is en encouraging change but i also see that the resistance is particularly severe in business schools and that might be because you know business schools tend to be a bit more connected to practitioners so they have to maintain that objectivity and rigor and they are relatively less theorizing around abstract phenomena if compared to other uh, schools, other social sciences um, areas, right? So that is one thing. But I wanted to ask you more about when you said you don't think that business schools can use futures and foresight as a cash cow because we cannot teach hundreds of students futures and forest set. Seems that seems that you assume that futures and forest set cannot make it to the mainstream. Um, so before disagreeing with that, I, yeah. I wanted to give you more opportunity to, to elaborate more on that. Why is Again, that? Again, as I said, that where in my experience, where business schools sat in universities mm. was they were very welcome when they produced revenue paying students in great numbers okay because again business schools have their own insecurity in universities <laughs> they are attacked by all sides they're the yes. non-rigor non-rigorous yes. animals they are That's the right. yeah of course so, so you know uh, business schools now are, are basically fighting their own fight to even stay in universities and mm -hmm. there, and so you know the jealousies of what you know physical sciences and others would have had for them. I mean, to me they were mollified because they brought money. I mean they didn't bring prestige, they didn't bring research, they didn't bring you know they didn't have you know five star journals and everything else. So you just brought money. Okay, you were welcome. Once business schools stopped producing large amounts of money, then I think universities started the question of saying, why have we got a business school? when business schools are under pressure inside universities and then you come along saying maybe we should offer force <laughs> i don't um, know peter i think there is a silver lining there because you can also use foresight as a leverage to say you know actually we've been bad because we have not been able to as yeah. business schools uh, keep up with the times and we need oh. more forward-oriented disciplines and yes, maybe yes. actually force it. I see this in another manner. I see this yes. as a tool, as a leverage point to say, maybe we can restore our yes. all good old days. Why not? If you have a dean that thinks that way, yes, <laughs> you You're can. Lucky. <laughs> yes. If you have a dean that says, the way I secure our business school is I go down an accreditation process using AACSB and, yeah, we, yeah, and we become... Yeah. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, but you know, the deans of business schools are decision makers. They have a problem. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you know, they maybe choose a way to go. And yeah, they choose the way to go. Yeah. If I'm in one where they're choosing, like you're saying, how can we how can we make business school different by using foresight and and yeah, yeah, we can do it. But mm. if that's not what the dean wants to do, then you're crazy to try because yeah. you're going to be, you're going to have your own little version of the Sarko game. You're talking to the, you're talking to the warriors <laughs> as, as an intellectual and the guns are suddenly, and the guns will very, very quickly stop being pointed at them over there. Hang on. Who's this person? <laughs> yeah. Let's do a Sarko game with business calls. Deans. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I agree with you. It depends on the case and you might not be successful but maybe there is a there is a, a way in between now especially with what have happened uh, let me tell you an anecdote that corroborates my point uh, nus business school has been offering an amazing 
executive MBA scenario planning course for 25 years. And uh, just before the pandemic in 2019, a new, a new dean came in. And as you know, new deans have to make things better. And usually they cut what they believe is not good or they cut what they believe or they cut what they don't know well, right? So I don't know what happened there. I'm not arguing that the dean did not know scenario planning. Maybe it did, but it might have happened that it didn't know it, know it well. So he had to cut something, it cut scenario planning. And it was such a distress to me because before it was cut, I had the opportunity to be a teaching assistant of the professor. So that's how I learned scenario planning um, from a great, great mentor, by the way, Clement Wang, to whom I'm very grateful. So I was very distressed. And then the thing is the pandemic came and it almost like in our face was clear that the choice wasn't wasn't such a such a discerning choice right yeah. so maybe for us now at this moment and again unfortunately it might not last too long because when we are in a boom of economy again then people are not going to pay much attention but at least now there might be a way and uh, a way to go in between and say you know actually if we do do some scenario work you you can teach students to develop those capabilities that yeah. are preparing you for the future. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, as I say, if you are going to do foresight in a university, then you need to be very, very adept at reading the culture yeah. and the moment in time and understanding there are times when you will get your moment and when you and when suddenly the opportunities arrive, be ready to run through the door as fast yeah. as you can and have the <laughs> plans ready to go yeah. and also keep your powder dry and go and go low profile when times are not good. Absolutely. But I also want to underline that the resistance we have been talking so far is about the pedagogical use or not use of Futures and Force, which certainly might have been the case in Australia. But in my experience, I've also seen a lot of resistance on the research side. And that might be because Singapore is a very research-oriented rather than teaching-oriented place for universities compared to Australia. But what I've noticed that the resistance to scholars studying Futures and Force has also been very strong because since we do a lot of qualitative work, sometimes it's not seen as rigorous in a very quantitative yep. environment. So th yep. that's what I've seen as well. Have you noticed yeah. that as well? Yeah, yeah again, it's, I mean, like, once again, I mean, I don't, as I said, I don't see, I don't see universities as any different to any organisation. They just don't, mm. they're an okay. organisation. And people, people want to be sure that their turf is safe. Yeah. And people who potentially could yeah you know, if i see people different to me as threats then i will play the sarco game a particular way but if i don't see them as threats i see them as opportunities or collaborators or networkers then i play the game differently so yeah. i talked about in sarco we talked about the healthy and unhealthy form and clearly research can be such that everybody wins the research is better the you know you know uh, there's more opportunity and there's the other response to it that says, no, stick within your boundary, you know, yeah. uh, uh, tear people down that are different. If they become smaller, you become richer. Yeah. Same and size. That's, and that's a dynamic. But if, but on that basis, we don't get more, we just get less. I mean, that's a race to the bottom. So there's always, there's always behavior. There is always behavior. And we understand that behavior can be a choice. And and people people I think should be encouraged to choose their responses, and to choose their responses with the future in mind. Well stated. Hopefully, someone uh, directing universities, uh, business schools such as deans will be listening to this. <laughs> uh, Peter, I have uh, one last question for you. And uh, so far, I thank you so much because we have been having a, quite a long conversation compared to other. Uh, to other episodes, but I didn't want to interrupt because I think this is a, of extreme value and we have talked about the games and I didn't want to uh, interrupt all your insights that. So let me ask you a more light question now in closing. And that is the question about 
what uh, actually brought us together, a, a passion that we share, that is podcasting. You have been um, a very consistent podcaster in the past few years with FuturePod, which is certainly the most uh, prominent and established, established and well-regarded podcast in the field of futures and foresight. You have by now interviewed 90 plus people, right? And so my question for you is, how do you see this endeavor? Why mm. have you done it? And also, what have you learned throughout this process? You have talked to so many uh, interesting scholars and practitioners. So by itself, in and of yourself, you are a case study because you have a sample of experiences. So by itself, you are an object of study for me, right? So tell us more about why you're doing it and what you've learned along the way. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, future part is a number of people. It's not just me. I've, I've happened to be oh. doing a lot of the recordings. The other, yeah, and there are other people are doing recordings, and I'm happy to say we're actually bringing some fresh interviewers on board to FuturePod. So we're going to hear some different people doing interviews. So certainly my motivation, and I think it was also shared by Mindy and Rebecca and also uh, uh, Amanda and Rihanna who are coming on. I mean, we really saw just opportunity through extending the conversations to actually letting people hear about foresight, learn from foresight um, by simply promoting the people and the conversations and the ideas and the epistemologies and ontologies that go with that. And just to simply see, you know, to simply create something that allowed people to enter and listen and maybe learn and maybe get inspired and maybe get creative and maybe then decide to do something. So that was so at one level, it was really about amplifying and providing stimulus to the community's thinking, as well as honouring people that I felt needed to be honoured, needed to be shouted out and said thank you and everything else. The thing that I've... The thing for me that also is important, Alex, and it's kind of a double... There's a bit of a dilemma here. It's, it's a pop probably not a dilemma, it certainly is I believe strongly in professionalism. I believe strongly in us professionalising the field when we're, when we're, you know, having careers and giving advice, then we should be professional, we should have professional associations, we should have uh, research that supports what we're doing, and we should do all those things to make the field a professional field in all those things. Against that is I don't think we should, the futures field has to be open. The other thing about FuturePod, why I've been delighted, is I've learned that's how broad the community is. <laughs> it's more than the academics. It's more than the people who teach futures. It's more than the people who even know who wrote the theories and did the consulting. I mean, People are finding the community where, you know, we're talking to artists, we're talking to designers, we're talking to activists. And this this, this is my other great you know, you're learning. It's just reminded me again how the future and the futures that we wish is something that everybody is interested in, not just not just futurists and foresight people, not just academics and consultants, but everybody's interested in it. And given half a chance, they will tell you what they want. And given half a chance, they'll tell you what they're doing. So to me, it's kind of this notion that we want the field to be effectively more effective, bigger reach, uh, more legitimate, more professional, better for everybody involved. And another level, we want the field not to be a field. <laughs> Yes. that is somehow resists people or that is tied up in jargon or is tied up in technicalities and barriers, that, you know, we cannot do that. We cannot have a futures discipline that people are both interested in but are repelled or feel they're not welcome. Yeah. And so that's kind of, that's kind of what, 
what's behind future pod and as we just do it is that yeah again we'll still be you know following the people doing the rigorous academic and everything else but also wandering off to find the people that for whatever they might not even call themselves part of our community but they give yeah. people in the community inspiration hope ideas and everything else yes i want to echo uh, your points um I think the value of this is tremendous when you consider that so much of our discourse is based on the future. So yeah, definitely involving people who are at least now outside of the field. Let's just say at least now they consider themselves outside of the field, but eventually slowly growing through this podcast and uh, involving them in conversations. I mean, I could think of at least 10 authors who are, uh, very much established, perhaps extremely regard well regarded globally. They talk about the future without having dialogue with our field, right? So I, I eventually hope that our efforts, including Future Pod and oh. other podcasts, will engage those actors, right, in a in a in a dialogue. And another point I want to echo that you mentioned is that there has been a lot of conflict between democratizing the futures and professionalizing the futures, which I guess is what you were implying a bit with mm. what you said, right? And I, like you, I don't see the two as mutually exclusive. I think on one hand, we can professionalize the way we do it and engage, sorry, and encourage a better understanding of how to do it, how to facilitate futures and foresight interventions or enhance capabilities and methods. But on the other, I don't see this as against encouraging a basic understanding of the basic principles of looking at different futures in the wider population of individuals who might not necessarily interested be interested in the specific methodologies, the specifics yeah. of the methodology. So I yeah, think I, mean, as, as, no, again, yeah. I don't think I don't think it's I don't think it's naturally oppositional. What yes. I would say, Alex, is that unless we are consciously trying to make it accessible, mm. we may find that it becomes inaccessible. I don't think that accessibility is a natural condition. I think it can be something you design for yes. and you encourage, but I think you have to actually you have to design for it and encourage it. Yes, you have to be conscious of it and you know, the very fact by sheer statistics, the very fact that if we have more manpower to do it professionally, well, then it's more likely that there will be people who, just statistically speaking, right? It's more likely that there will be people who put some effort into devolving it into to the population at large. Well, this fact to me is very empowering, right? So I commend you for the the engagement that you have created with a platform like futurepod yes and in terms of advice that. generally i just i mean the thing about again the things that we've learned is that i mean again and it's not just futures and foresight i'm sure it's for anybody out there who wants to do something is most people are generous with their time that most people when you you know when you ask to talk to them, and I'm sure you found this, that most people yeah. say, "Yeah, happy to talk, happy to happy right. to come on, happy to share, happy to you know help." Um, it's probably interesting that, and I don't know how you found it, but I don't know if it's a genderized response, but you know, men certainly do seem more willing to talk than women. Yeah, same here, same here. <laughs> um, which is interesting. I don't know what. And you can look at that one. The it, the technology is such now that content production is much easier than it was certainly you know, ten you know, twenty years ago. Yeah. So yeah, you can produce, I think, high quality content, audio, video, whatever combination from relatively little capital outlay and technologically you don't need a lot and 
you can become reasonably proficient in a you know in a fairly short while so to me the whole the whole digital internet you know internet revolution in communication which we're seeing is just tearing apart existing uh you know uh, channels again we're part of that we're part of that now yeah and so yeah i just and it, it's something that i just yeah i've been delighted by just how quickly it's grown and particularly I'm delighted by seeing that there are now people like yourselves and others who are joining in and we're now seeing more people wanting to do it because to me the communication, the accessibility is the key thing about because everyone's interested in the future and everybody is starting to become passionate and as, as Riel Miller would say, and we're trying to become literate in it. Yeah. One of the things that helps us build literacy is having access to conversations and listen and the ability to listen to other people talk about it and you build a form of literacy and then ultimately hope people then will start expressing themselves about what they want indeed let's hope that more people will join the family hopefully more podcasts will be available and also to different kinds of group i mean i can think of Futures and Foresight podcast a bit more oriented in the experiential direction, the design fiction direction. I can think of podcasts focused on organizational, uh, business related, Futures and Foresight, and the, and another podcast for governmental Foresight. There are so many directions people yeah. can go right, right now, right? So yeah, yeah, I hope that these conversations we're having are encouraging possibly even more endeavor endeavors like uh, the one me and you are 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 doing. Peter, I noticed that we have been very much beyond the time we've planned. So I, again, I think this was valuable, uh, extremely valuable. So I'm going to keep it as it is. Uh, but um, my mind is starting to melt down. So I'm, I'm going to call it a wrap, if you don't mind. No, it's fine. All right. Well, Peter, I thank you so much for this conversation. This was a sequel of a conversation we had at FuturePod. For the audience who is not aware of FuturePod, uh, one of the most amazing podcasts about the future and about the practice of futures and foresight. If you want to know more about it, I'm going to paste the link to the website in the description box down below. And with that, thanks, Peter. And I, I hope that we will talk again in another of these conversations. Thanks, Alex.